the Extreme Ideas public program series consists of four events that looks at the architecture beyond its traditional boundaries. This also springs from <coughs> AUD's own focus. For those of you not familiar with AUD, we are leading player on the international stage of contemporary architecture from established leaders in the field to today's emerging voices. We have a, we have a faculty that is committed to advancing design as means to transform society and renew culture. And we are deeply immersed in a research environment that anticipates changes and moves from the realm of ideas to their application from present situation to the future. So when we were invited to participate in the Pacific Standard Time present modern architecture in LA, we knew that the strongest contribution that we could add was to carry the narrative of modern architecture from its influential past to the future. Against the background of the history of Los Angeles architecture, which is being Accentually described in a series of exhibitions, a program of the Modern Architecture Initiative, we wanted to look beyond the field's traditional boundaries and explore topics arising from rapidly emerging new technologies and the growing interdisciplinary collaborations. Tonight's conversation, Extreme Culture, is one of the four events that were conceived as a whole to create an in depth and sustained conversation about the future. And as Glick Lindsay prompted last week about our very notion of what's futuristic. Core to the concept of the Extreme Ideas program are the questions. What comes next? What are the new boundaries of the field? What are the effects of the rapidly emerging new technologies? What are the new possibilities for interdisciplinary interaction? What role will Los Angeles play in the evolution of the architecture? What are our visions <coughs> of the future? The three panels, extreme intelligence, extreme culture, and extreme environment, are certainly not the only lens through which to view the future, but they uh, do represent the conversation in which architecture plays a central role in the nexus of interdisciplinary uh, discourse, invention, and work. Last week, we began this conversation about architecture's role when we heard from filmmaker Joseph Kosinski, who actually attracted his career as a film director from his training as an architect during the analog to digital transition, and discussed how his architectural background contributed to the imagery of his latest film, Oblivion. I imagine that uh, we will hear more about architecture's role in this interdisciplinary conversation tonight as well. We organized three extreme ideas conversations at the three venues of the UCLA campus in order to keep our focus on Los Angeles, a city that has been a long time laboratory to continually emerging and the nature uh, nurture new uh, visions for the future. Our first panel was held in a, one of the most recent of the old cities, Century City. And tonight we are in the West Adams, one of the oldest neighborhood in Los Angeles at the UCLA Clark Memorial Library. UCLA is internationally renowned library for rare books and the manuscript, the fitting venue for the discussion about the culture. Our third panel on June 5th is at the Griffiths Observatory, not only an icon of Los Angeles, but also the perfect venue to explore the extreme environment, including space. As you are making your calendars, please also mark June 28th. I want to especially invite you all to the fourth event in the Extreme Ideas series on June 28th at yet another historic Los Angeles venue. Runway is a celebration to mark the combination of the Pacific Standard Time Present Initiative's Los Angeles Architecture Month. We have invited noted architects, designers, and thinkers to share their thought on the future through a series of fast-paced back-to-back -back presentations. 
The event will take place at our department new satellite facility ideas at the Hercules campus in Playa Vista, where Howard Hughes built in a spruce goose aircraft in the 1940s. Runway will be sneak peek of ideas, which officially launches in August of this year to house our newly expanded uh, Super Studio program. We will have strong emphasis on cross-discipline research and development to expand the future boundaries of our field in this new uh, campus. So as you can see, tonight's panel is just one event in a very exciting journey into the future that we can all take together. The Extreme Idea Series owes many thanks. First and foremost to the Getty <coughs> Foundation. So thank you for your major support and leadership and inspiration. Our gratitude goes also to Toyota and Boeing, additional sponsor of the Extreme Ideas. To the uh, uh, AUD faculties and staff, many thanks. And program like this, this one, requires team and your great team to whom I am much indebted. Thank you. So tonight's event is led by AUD faculty Greg Lin, who will introduce the member of this conversation that looks at the extreme culture and the, the mix of real and virtual. So before I invite Greg to the stage, I want to say a few words about him. He's a tenure professor at UCLA and he and his office, Greg Lin Fong, have won hours for buildings and projects, including Golden Lion Award for, at the Venice Biennale of Architecture, the American Academy uh, of the Arts and Letters Architecture Award, and the Fellowship from United States Artists. And he graduated from Miami University of Ohio with a Bachelor of Environmental Design and Bachelor of Philosophy degrees from Princeton University with a Master of Architecture degree. He is also the author of seven books. So please welcome Greg Lin. Okay, well, I think it's better if I read the official bios of our participants and then say a little something about them personally. Um, it's really a pleasure to have Tom and Scott here. Tom Krenz is the founder and CEO of Global Cultural Asset Management, and from 1988 to 2008 was the director and chief artistic officer of the Solomon R. Guggenheim Foundation. Uh, I think he really doesn't need an introduction um, because the importance of him in, in both our field and culture in general. He was responsible for the operation of five museums um, while at the Guggenheim Foundation, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in New York, Peggy Guggenheim Collection in Venice, the Guggenheim Museum Bilbao in Spain, the Deutsche Guggenheim in Berlin, and the Guggenheim Hermitage Museum Las Vegas. And by the way, there are architects behind each one of those things, and Tom really has invented contemporary architecture in my book and picks what's going on very well. During his 20-year tenure at the Guggenheim Foundation, he produced 292 exhibitions for this museum network. As Guggenheim director, he doubled the size of the Guggenheim collection, completed two major restorations of the Wright Design Guggenheim Museum in New York, doubled the size of the Guggenheim collection in Venice, and increased the foundation endowment from $25 million to $120 million. He conceived and executed the Guggenheim Museum Bilbao and the Deutsche Guggenheim Berlin. He was responsible for developing the Sadiat Island Cultural District Master Plan for the government of Abu Dhabi, and in November 2008, signed the agreements for the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi Museum, which is under construction now. Now, I think um, there's a lot more we could say about Tom, um, but I really believe that he has invented contemporary architecture, in my opinion. I can't think of any person outside of the field who's had a more profound influence on the field than Tom. Scott Trowbridge. Scott, I had the pleasure to collaborate with as a partner in one of the super studios two or three years ago, and immediately found Scott to be pretty much the person with his finger on the pulse of environments and technology and entertainment. I couldn't think of anybody better to be here tonight. <clears throat> Scott's the vice president of creative at Walt Disney Imagineering Research and Development. 
He leads a global team that produces new and unique ways to entertain people, ranging from all kinds of disciplines, film, theater, interactive and transmedia experiences, state-of-the-art theme parks. Scott works with robots, he works with performers, dancers. I mean, he integrates all kinds of performance media into immersive environments. Um, he's produced, directed, and integrated entertainment projects all over the world. Uh, he looks for opportunities to combine various media, technologies, and narrative forms to tell new stories and create innovative entertainment experiences. As a graduate, and this is okay, we wish he was from UCLA, as a graduate of USC School of Cinematic Arts, <laughs> Scott started his career in film and theater and continues to drive innovation through his oversight of both the Blue Sky Creative and New Technology Development Groups for Disney Imagineering. Um, it doesn't say this, but I also was with my kids at a Universal theme park where there was, I was on a Spider-Man ride, which was a roller coaster and a box with video and an active car and projecting images on glasses on my head. And I mentioned that Scott should go take a look at it. He said, oh, I designed that. That's the work for a while with Universal. Okay, but so tonight what, what we're doing is UCLA is trying to rethink what architecture is doing with itself and what our young uh, graduates should be thinking about for the future and how to prepare them to be not only architects that are providing services to the building industry, but preparing them to be cultural leaders and to think about what it is to be an architect in society today um, with larger aspirations. And so we've been bringing in a group of people who we respect and who keep an eye on architecture. Um, in terms of tourism, culture, art, entertainment, global development, urbanism. I can't think of two people that have their finger on the pulse of what architecture can do more than Tom and Scott. Um, they're, be, they're both leading you know, billions of dollars of projects all over the world and thinking about how to change cities. So um, selfishly, we've invited them here to tell us what they think is going on and to tell us what architecture might be able to do and how it might need to change in the future. Um, but before we do that, I thought it would be good if we just took two or three minutes and had each of them tell us what they're doing and talk to us about kind of what, what they see is going on before we start a conversation. So Tom, we, we have some slides of projects Tom is working on and has worked on. If you could just tell us kind of what you're doing, what's on your plate. Well, um, I mean, this is hardly a presentation. I got a message from my assistant that Layla asked for it was five of you. Layla okay, asked. five of so who, you. Who, who turns the button? Can somebody turn the button and make a picture go? Uh, the clicker. Oh, you have it. I got the clicker. Greg didn't tell you the last time we met was in uh, the soccer hotel in uh, Vienna about oh, that the, wasn't so bad. three or four months ago. And I think you got stuck with a check for all of those drinks. No, no, as long as you don't tell about the time before that, we okay. met in Venice. Okay. Um, I just a couple, a couple of projects. I mean, obviously, I mean, you know, Frank is here in the audience, and this is the uh, Guggenheim and Bill Bow. And I, we did, or sorry, in Abu Dhabi. And, and one of the things that, um, or the questions, we got a list of maybe questions we wanted to address in the seminar, and one of them was the function of scale. And, sorry, and uh, Abu Dhabi, at least when I was involved, it was about scale. I mean, um, I don't even know what this calculates out to, but I remember that uh, as I left the Guggenheim, it was an $815 million construction project, and you can buy a lot of museum for $815 million dollars and there was 53,000 square meters of programming space which means that it's close to 600,000 square feet of pure programming space and in spaces that you couldn't imagine like these cones for example which are all hollow but they're what I think they were what Frank 80 meters high or but they couldn't be taller than the Sheikh Zayed monument or something but they're about 80 meters high so they're 200 you know that's a you know, 80 meters, 250 feet, it's like a 20-story building. So um, it's, a, it's a, an extraordinary project. And we used to call it the apotheosis because it was like the, sum, the summary of everything. And the next one quickly is, uh, uh, this is a project in Istanbul that we're doing with Zaha Hadid. It's a relatively small museum uh, called the Dempsey Museum. It's supposed for contemporary art. And 
18th, 19th, and early 20th century Turkish art. I got 2,000 paintings. Uh, the next one. This is actually also by Zaha Hadid. This is an interesting project. It's in Changsha, which is in south central China. It's one of those cities that you know, nobody's ever heard of that's got a population of 7 million uh, people. Um, it's the birthplace of Mao Zedong, uh, by the way, uh, or at least he's come from a village right next door. They have a big statue of Mao Zedong. Um, and this is a 36,000 square meter museum and performing arts center. This is under construction and uh, uh, we're designing the program and we'll probably operate it for the first five years and it has some interesting features. And then this is actually in Beijing. It's a 47,000 square meter former Sony television factory. Um, the architect is Zhu Pei, a Chinese architect, and I think there's one B, one more. Oh yeah, I got that. We put this in. This is something we've just started working on in, in Vienna. It's what I call an enhanced sort of uh, arch uh, arch design program, is that the building is very, very constrained. It's 60 by 60 by 60 meters, so that means that it's, uh, what, you know, like 15 stories high. So what we do, I have a couple of architects on my team, and we just kind of like do a series of conceptual designs uh, for whoever is the architect of this building. Um, and, and the message of this building is that it has to be, um, we've got to use every square meter because it's about 33,000 square meters and that's a critical number. So all we did was just offset the floors and stuck some signage on it. It's not architecture, but it's kind of like, it's enhanced program design that you can give to the architect. And because I wanted to have retail, entirely on the ground floor, entirely retail. Um, you had to have the entrance out in the plaza, and uh, so I stuck one of Frank's uh, lamps on it, his uh, fish <laughs> buildings. And so it's supposed to be a, a, you know, a 30 meter fish. That's a, another, what, 100 feet. So it's like an eight or nine story building if that ever happens. But we just started looking at that. So those are kind of like some of the projects that we do. So more or less what we do is kind of like a continuation of what I was doing at the Guggenheim, except we do it a little bit cheaper now for governments that don't want to pay the licensing fee for the Guggenheim mm -hmm. brand. <laughs> Perfect. All right, Scott, what's on your plate? Um, so I, I, I also uh, was press ganged into providing some images, and I'm not even sure what they were, so we'll, we'll, we'll discover these together. We're going to go on this journey together, so you know, strap in. Keep your arms and legs inside. Um, so when we talked about the areas that we're working in, um, I thought it was, instead of showing some, some pictures of projects underway, which would not have been uh, nearly as impressive, I, I, don't, I, don't think we have a, I don't think we have a fish over 10 meters, um, <laughs> so they're not nearly as impressive, but I, I picked a couple of images that kind of talk about the areas that we're working in at Imagineering, and you know, uh, one thing I should say about Imagineering is, you know, I think people uh, think of us as the, the place that designs the cruise ships and theme parks and hotels and resorts and all that stuff for Disney. And that is absolutely true. That is that is what we do. Um, we have about 140 different disciplines and it's everything from, you know, we have a, kind of an embedded architectural firm, an interior design firm, graphics, lighting, audio, all the kinds of stuff that we use to make um, these places uh, real um, construction management companies, you know, um, mechanical, civil, uh, structural engineering, all you know, internal. Of course, we work with that, with uh, lots of groups outside as well. Um, but we also have sculptors, poets, computer scientists, uh, botanists, uh, biologists, all kinds of people who help us bring the quote unquote magic to life. When we do uh, what we do well, we actually, uh, and we don't always do it well, fully fully granted. But when we do it well, we we allow people to believe that they're having an experience that they're not possibly really having yet. You know, it is a, it's a fake place that provides absolutely real experiences for people, and they're designed to be shared, too. And this is, this is actually where uh, we rely very heavily on, on architecture, because that experience of space, and we, we think about it very cinematically, but that experience of space we use to bring people together to share experiences. The kinds of things we're working on now are really driving those folks um, we're hoping to drive those folks from being uh, consumers and spectators to being more engaged participants in experiences. Um, and if we, if when we do that properly, then we can actually turn them from uh, participants in, engaged uh, in something to actual activists. Um, you know, in some ways, we're just following in Walt Disney's footsteps. 
uh, who, who really firmly believed that happy people make the world a better place. Um, and we're fully kind of engaged in that mission right now of if we can put people in a space in which they can use their imagination, if they can believe that things that couldn't possibly be true could become true, uh, we believe, I believe, that those are the people who will actually make those amazing things come true. They will actually imagine that the world can be a better place, the world can be a more productive place, the, the world can be a more sustainable place. You, if we can unlock that imagination and prove that magical things can happen, uh, then they will. So some of the ways that, now here's the, here's the sad fact of this is, you know, that quote unquote Disney magic, we haven't perfected that yet. We don't actually know how to make that kind of magic, but we know how to fake the magic pretty well. Um, Arthur C. Clarke said, you know, famously, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, and that is, honestly, that, that, that's how I make my living, uh, is by, you know, mind uh, freaking people um, day in and day out. Uh, a couple of examples of, what, of, of how we're doing that work right now. What you see here is actually, uh, we're very much uh, interested in looking at virtual spaces and what the human experience is, is in a virtual space um, and, and how people interact uh, with each other in, uh, in mediated virtual environments. And it's actually, it's quite interesting. I'll the clicker, yeah. Um, we're also looking at how people play uh, in spaces. Uh, using space as a um, a character almost, and to guide play and to guide interaction uh, is another is another very interesting interesting area that at least for me that we're that we're kind of looking at. How do we actually create spaces? How do we actually modulate spaces, dynamic spaces, spaces that are reactive and aware of who's using them and how and why, and kind of guide them together towards more directed, authored, uh, and empowered experiences. Go to the next. A lot of times these spaces aren't going to be filled with just other people. Um, a lot of times we want these spaces, especially when they become more reactive and aware, to be populated by non-human forms, to be populated by uh, large, you know, characters or large, uh, I don't know, pieces of furniture or large walls or things that... Uh, that are as aware of you as you are of them. To do that re requires us to really have a, a, a pretty robust understanding of mechanical systems and robotics. That's an area we spend a lot of time in. Walt Disney himself, back in 1964, kind of unveiled this, you know, this world of humanoid robots, robots with the, you know, kind of that Abraham Lincoln in 1964. Um, today we look at that and kind of go, it's a little cheesy. Um, you know, honestly, our robots haven't gotten much better since, but we are working on bridging that uncanny valley now um, with all the kind of underlying technology that's required to make systems and objects and spaces that can be autonomous, that can be self-powered, that can be self-repairing, uh, that can be self-dynamically balancing, and that can pay as much attention to you as you are to it again. Uh, and then finally, here's another image. Actually, one of the things that we're doing is also looking at how do we create systems that allow designers to work more in their natural environment. This is a, um, uh, a space we call the DISH, or the Digital Interactive show Showroom. And it is, uh, here uh, is a, uh, an Imagineer who is actually using uh, the most sophisticated architectural tool ever invented, SketchUp. Um, to create a space, but, but the way he's creating this space is actually what's interesting. He's actually using his hands uh, to create this SketchUp model in real time all around him. So he's standing in the space creating, you know, sketching architecturally uh, around him using some simple hand gestures and some uh, kind of a design, uh, a design interface language that we've been developing. The goal here is to allow designers to design from within their creation and to get a sense of what it's like to experience that space uh, the way the um, audience is eventually going to. So those are the kinds of areas we're looking at. Sounds great. Okay, so if we could get the lights up. <clears throat> so it seems, I heard both of you use the word impossible. Um, how tough is it to stay ahead of the artists? How tough is it to get people on an airplane to come to a museum? How tough is it to stay ahead of self-driving cars and home robots and things? I mean, how, how do you guys both do keep ahead and keep doing impossible things? 
Well, I'm not sure I do that. Maybe you should answer that first. <laughs> well, I think there's 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 two answers to that. One is faking the impossible, right? By um, by making by by creating a context, a narrative in which people can believe uh, that they are experiencing the impossible. And obviously, that takes a that takes a combination of of technology, but also just you know storytelling, craftsmanship, and just frankly old school theatrics to make the impossible. Uh, possible. Before we started the seminar, I was sharing with you and, and, and a, a few others uh, some imagery uh, of, a, of a, a dance workshop that we did earlier this year that you know really kind of showed. Um, the question was, how is that possible? Um, and you know, the, the answer is 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 surprisingly simple and therefore somewhat disappointing. Mm -hmm. But you sh you shouldn't care when we when we do it well. You shouldn't care how something's actually done. If it seems impossible, it, it should resonate as being impossible. The other part of your question about how do we kind of be ready for what's coming? Uh, how do we kind of listen to those weak signals and kind of try to anticipate where the world is going? That's super hard to do. Oh, it's super hard to do well. Um, and oftentimes I'll, I'll, I meet a lot of, in doing what I do, I meet a lot of people who describe themselves as futurists and I, I kind of almost immediately kind of lose interest in, 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 in them. Anybody who kind of claims to be a professional futurist from my perspective is, you know, I've yet to meet the one that has really impressed me. Let me put it that way. So if you're if you're in the room tonight, please say hello. I promise <laughs> not to dismiss you outright, and, and and I'm prepared to be impressed. Um, but one way that I think we can anticipate the future is actually through art. Um, what I have found, and I'll just speak for myself, is you know I'm sure this is you know, many of you would agree that you know in a lot of ways art tells us where things are going. I think the artist's intuition is tapped into uh, whatever kind of zeitgeist it's tapped into that allows us to understand um, where things are headed. This was you know, definitely true. You can, you know, if you look at the way, I, I look around this room at the, at the art in this room, and I, it kind of reminds me of you know, how the art, you know, over time those artistic movements kind of you know, um, predicated the advancements of understanding and, and uh, in theoretical particle and ultimately quantum physics. I just find that fascinating. I, and I think it's true in science fiction as well. When I, when I think about authors like Arthur C. Clarke or Ray Bradbury or Isaac Asimov, who you know, kind of invented the idea of robots and satellites and, and, and communicating, communication devices, that, you know, computers that fit into your pocket, that, I mean, that was science fiction. But, they're all, you know, but that stuff came, became real. And, and was it that they were great futurists and they predicted the future so accurately, maybe. Uh, I think it was probably more that they were artists who created a vision so compelling that it bent the future to meet their vision. You know, and I'm sure it's probably a blend of both of those things, but I think really the, the key to understanding where the future could go, both in terms of, of, of technology, but also experience, and, and ultimately, you know, kind of the human experience moving forward is uh, we, we look to art. Tom, where do you think, uh, I mean, you say it's not, but you have done things at a scale and with artists and with a vision for where art's going that I don't see other museums doing. Well, uh, let, me, uh, let me try to describe this in two or three minutes if it's possible. I mean, first of all, <clears throat> I'm in this field completely accidentally. I mean, being a museum director it never occurred to me. I mean, it was just like I was a bystander in a set of circumstances that... Somebody said <clears throat> they had a building project. <clears throat> I was teaching at Williams College, kind of like, would you do it? So not being a member of the fraternity is a little bit like being uh, maybe being a Jesuit, you know, with all the cardinals in the Vatican. I mean, you know, that there's another way of kind of like looking at things. And um, since I was never <clears throat> part of that fraternity, I mean, I, through a series of circumstances, I found myself involved in projects that one of the issues was scale, you know, that, okay, art museums, well, what impresses you about art museums? I mean, not only drawings and sort of exquisite works that you can comprehend in front of you, but sometimes uh, are artists who, who have the opportunity to work on a certain scale. So then the question becomes, does the museum adjust itself to its own set of rules, or does it try to adjust itself to what you might intuit that an architect's potential is? 
you know, and of course, the, I mean, there were a couple of warm-ups, but Bilbao was essentially an extraordinary opportunity because, and it was, a, again, it was a circumstantial opportunity. It wasn't like the Basques were in love with culture. The Basques wanted to be independent from Spain, and they wanted a brand. And I had a, I had a similar, I, I had a, our, our arcs of desire intersected at a certain point. Theirs was largely political, and mine was material. But said, well, if you were going to build something, you had to have resources to do it, and resources are important. And we had a client who was who was prepared for political reasons to make the resources available. So you know, like we did an architectural competition because I mean, everybody does architectural architectural competitions. I'm not a big fan of architectural competitions, but. <clears throat> this one was special. They got to choose the architect, but I chose, I, I got to choose, because it was the Guggenheim, I got to choose three. So I said one from the US, one from Europe, and one from Asia. So I chose Harari Suzaki, Frank Gehry, and Koa Pimbleblau. We gave each of the architects a fee, $10,000. Wasn't a lot at the time, it's still not a lot. <laughs> and um, they had one site visit, and and no, 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 no requirements. They didn't have to produce anything. They just had to convince a jury. And we made a jury of seven people. Four of them were political people in the Basque country. One of them was myself, uh, who was it, Carmen Jimenez, and there was somebody else, Heinrich Klutz, I think it was. So we had seven people, but it was skewed to the Basque. And we even did the competition in Frankfurt. We didn't do it in Bilbao, because I didn't want to kind of like leaking around, but the point is, is that we agreed on all of these things before we started. We agreed on the budget, we agreed on the scale, we agreed we'd never go over the budget, and well, of course, Frank won, and then that turned to be a, an extraordinarily serendipitous thing, because I've worked with a lot of architects all life, not yet, yet. We, I mean, little we, thing. We, we, we still got, we still got some time. I haven't, I haven't worked on a project with Greg, but with Frank was an unusual Experience. I mean, Frank's kind of, I mean, everybody knows it in, in LA that well, but the kind of playing with possibilities and constructing things out of paper and blocks. And it was also an intersection of technology with his particular style. I used to say about Frank, he, you know, he, he would know a computer if it sort of fell out of the sky and hit him on the head. But he had people who could take his his drawings and his child's piles of shapes and forms. And right at the time, and this is the early 1990s, when the technology was just basically developed for the military to, to, to design jet fighters, is that that kind of technology could be applied to architecture and all of a sudden you could take a building like Bilbao, 11,000 pieces of steel and no two alike, you know, and actually build the building on time. I mean, um, it's this intersection of kind of like, what, what is it? It's not a, it's, you don't, you don't, nobody imagines it in the beginning. I mean, you got to get started. <laughs> so you have, to, you have to put the tools on the table. And in this case, it was, a, it was this arc of technology where Frank's particular style of architecture kind of like, intersected with, with design possibility, technological design possibility that could translate into a physical building that could be built because you have to keep in mind you got to build these things. You know, it's, so much of architecture has become technology to a certain extent in material science. You know, how, how, how can you make plastic that's six inches thick and have a certain kind of visual effect? I mean, it's not all woodwork and frames and stone buildings like this. So you had a series, if you look at this, there's a sort of a series of circumstances. I mean, in the Basque country is the worst, I mean, worst place. They had terrorism, 800 people have been killed in the previous 20 years. Um, I had people in Spain who said the Basque were baby killers or baby eaters or something like that. I mean, it was an intense political situation, but because they wanted something, which was completely different from what I wanted, but it intersected because they were willing to pay for it and they were willing to give us control. And that paying for it and giving it control then kind of like had this serendipitous exchange with Frank. I mean, Frank and I had worked on a project before together, but not at this level. And there was nothing that necessarily, I mean, there were things that suggested this level, but 
Yeah, we made over a thousand models, or he made over a thousand models. And we made models you can get inside of, which reminds me of the things that, that you're doing here, this kind of like physicality of the design process. It's a really extraordinary moment, you know, and the intensity of it. I mean, over a five-year period, I used to come in. I don't know Los Angeles. I just know the airport to uh, Frank Studio. You know, and it was pretty close, and that was about it. And I'd come in the morning, and I'd stay all day, and I'd leave in the afternoon, and I'd come twice a month for five years. And that was, uh, that's how we, we built that thing. And I kept telling them it had to be bigger. <laughs> and I always found that architects never could imagine space anyway. You know, they could imagine shapes, but they were not really good at imagining space. <laughs> and there we had a kind of like a certain serendipitous exchange. I was pressing on space because I wanted, my image was Shark Cathedral. I wanted it to be, you know, come out of the countryside when, you're big, when your experience of architecture is a two-story building in the 14th century and all of a sudden you see Shark Cathedral. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was kind of like a mental image of what Bill Bilbao mm -hmm. was. And because it wasn't constrained by any practical consideration that I cared about, I mean, not that they didn't have a valid political context, but the point is it was completely accidental. My being there was accidental. My being involved in museums was accidental. Getting to Basque was accidental. So it wasn't an accident you weren't talking to your board about doing something in New York. Uh, well, you know, boards are, you know what boards are like. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know their, their job is kind of like to, is, is not necessarily to, you know, to eradicate kind of like creativity, but some fairly close. <laughs> 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 How can, you get how can you get 30 people to agree on anything? Yeah. You know? I mean, you know, it's all about process and stuff like that. This was, this was good. I got, to choose, I got to choose three people. I got a government behind me. I said, you guys chose one. And hey, it wasn't slam dunk that Frank was going to win. But Frank did the best presentation, no doubt. You know, he took it seriously. He made a model. I told him it looked like a Donald Trump hotel. But you know, it was a start. And you know he the, he provided this kind of avuncular energy, you know, sort of like the Columbo of the architecture world, you know, and rumpled clothes. And you know, this is tape. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so Scott, how is it? How Shanghai? I mean, how is it working with not with only Disney, but working with partners? Um, well, we're actually quite used to working with you know partners because a lot of the projects we do are also at a, at a big scale. So quite often our partners are governments, uh, and we're, we have a project happening in, in Shanghai right now. Uh, will open uh, in a, about a year and a half, uh, which is you know, and, and the Chinese government is our partner. And you, you know what that's like. Uh, I'm afraid I do. And you know. You know, I mean, it's a big project. We're building two subway lines. Uh, it's about seven square kilometers of sculpture. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I just heard this statistic recently. We will have, at some point in time, over 4,000 uh, people living on the site building the project. This is the first time. This is the first time that's happened for me is where we've had, literally, we've had thousands of people living. The construction workers actually living on the site. That is a trip. <laughs> um, and just dealing with the logistics of, of a project of this size, um, but you know the, the thing is, you know, this is not our first project with a with a with a partner. This is not our first project with a foreign government. Uh, we have that in uh, Europe. We also have that in um, in Hong Kong, um, and it's always different because you know, as, as you were saying, the the goals, right? Our our uh, you know our goals. The Walt Disney Company. Our goal is, you know, to to create these great experiences that resonate with these audiences, and of course, to make money in the process of doing so. And, and they often have different different goals. It's either about, you know, it's lifting up a people or being better than somebody else or appearing to be better than somebody else. Uh, and and so aligning all those goals is is, is interesting. Aligning the cultural styles, the work, um, the way that work gets done, the DNA of what quality means um, is, is very interesting to work with these, you know, these projects. Well, I remember in around the same time that Tom was doing Bilbao, what Eisner was working with architects. I mean, in terms of patrons for world-class architecture and yeah. taking architects up to another level, um, Guggenheim and Disney were huge players in the 80s and 90s. And it was, I believe, because they saw something in the architecture 
that worked for them in this complicated equation. And I forgot about that. We did that thing for Disney, and it must have been when Eisner and Michael Ovitz were there. Mm -hmm. That I was the uh, American commissioner of the Biennale, yeah. and they didn't have any money to do it. The U.S. government decided to cut it off. So I went to Disney and said, "Do the architecture of uh, of Disney." I, I forgot about that. The architecture actually, of reassurance. We, we, we did a we because you, you had you had Bob Stern and Isazaki and all of these architectural projects. We did. We did. It was the American Great. Pavilion one year. Well, I know, I hope I can say this. When I went to see some of Scott's colleagues about Shanghai, they said we have a kind of a war room with ideas, and they had eight and a half by 11s with post-its, and they had all the way down to my graduate students. You had inventory the world of architecture and what was going on. I mean, you had people there, really obscure architects from all over the world that I thought I was the only person that knew, but you had a team of people on it looking for what architecture could bring to the Shanghai to one of the parks, but uh -huh. it seems like you're... Is this, you said this is a subway system and not a park? No, no, we're, we're building two subway systems to go to the park. I mean, it's to a, the to, park? To, just to talk about the where's, scale where's of the, the park. Where's the park? Is it on the Pudong side? Yeah, it's on Pudong. It's about halfway between, you, you, you guys all know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> it's about halfway between the airport and yeah. uh, and downtown Pudong. If you yeah. if you go yeah, along yeah, the, I know, the I know Maglev, exactly. Yeah, I know exactly. it's actually at the midpoint of the Maglev. Really? Where the Maglev is going the fastest. And this is going to be, I mean, I think I've heard about, I definitely heard about this, but this is, when is it open? About a year and a half. Wow. Yeah. I don't do anything like that. No, it's big. No, it's big. <laughs> I don't recommend it, <laughs> frankly. But so what, is, what, what does architecture do for you guys? I mean, what do, do you feel like you pull the architects along, or do they well, push wait, wait, somewhere? Well, wait, wait a second. What Scott was talking, let, let's, before we get to that, All right. let's, let, let's look at this part, is that, how are these two... How do you define these two fields? I mean, we're talking about, you know, what, what museums on one side and kind of like, what, experiential theme parks, if you will, or on the well, other. entertainment or, spaces. Entertainment it's all about entertainment. But, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a clear statement. I mean, because I think in a way that, you know, this is the sort of the future because we're, again, it's one of the questions that I got from Layla about, uh, um, what are the? Do you have the question? Got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Innovation, somewhere. I got architecture, lots of visual culture. What roles do you have the scale have? Oh, here it is. The difference between entertainment and art. The very first question. The difference between entertainment and art, because you start, you, you come at these things through the con from, from the standpoint of art museums. Well, I, art museums are kind of like churches. You know, there are these sort of temples. It's a kind of contemplative experience. It's kind of like, it's almost supposed to be work. You know, that you gotta know what you're kind of like doing before you kind of like get there or it doesn't mean anything. Unless you do the motorcycle show, or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but the, the entertainment has a different, it, it, it kind of has a different point of departure because one is sort of, is like the church, it's kind of like the museums are separate from, but they're not really, just like the Vatican's not not a business, but they're, they're, they, they, there's something about the popular imagination are meant to be sort of separate and off to the mm -hmm. side. And they have another set of conditions that drive their programs. So they come to, come to this architecture, because where architecture intersects it is at a, at a, at a point of actuality, because you're building something physical, and the physical things are kind of like buildings. So, so why not? It doesn't have to be. I and mean, if you look at the evolution of of, of, uh, of amusement parks, particularly in China, because you know China, they started out. They, everything in China gets collapsed. I mean, you know, like 15, 20 years ago, big developers were doing amusement parks and putting houses around them, and then it became kind of like theme parks, a little bit like, well, here's Paris, you know, on a slightly yeah, they, smaller scale. They became amenities to yeah. these real estate development projects. And now they want to do high culture. You know, now they, they want to do museums and have the, you know, and golf courses kind of like it's sort of, nice. you know, <laughs> New York and Las Vegas combined with kind of like all of these things around it. Um, but I've always thought that the entertainment side of the from the museum side shouldn't be underestimated. Yeah. And that was where kind of like scale came in. And that's where, you know, what Frank did in Bill Bow, and actually what Frank Lloyd Wright did, because you know, I had this experience of Frank Lloyd Wright, 
you know, you walk into the rotunda and you kind of go through, you know, he compresses you and then all of a sudden the space, ex the space explodes to almost 100 feet in the rotunda. You know, that's a dramatic, there's probably, I can't think of any space in New York that's as dramatic or as high as except Madison Square Garden, but I mean, it's not like the, it's not like the same thing. And it just had this sort of aesthetic, sort of referential and, you know, very sort of articulated vision of it. But, <clears throat> and he was really responding to emotion. I mean, the same thing that you're talking about with the entertainment side of it is that what you want is a suspension of belief you want to kind of like to amaze. It's kind of like the motivations are similar. So I always thought that, you know, museums should move toward more toward the entertainment side of this on, on every level that I've heard you refer to, on the level of virtual reality, on the level of technology. I mean, I, I could imagine you go to a museum and you have one of these handheld devices and you know, it's kind of like somehow instantly can give you all the information that you want about anything. I mean, much better than even now, you know, than iPads and stuff. I mean, just fast and quick and research, everything. So you can go to a museum, you can make a museum a complete, you know, and then the virtual reality side of it. I mean, what happens when all this gets wired through our brains directly and then you don't need the physical spaces anymore? It's a, then it's a licensing issue, it's just electrodes. You, you put one in one ear and one on the other and it's just chemistry. It alters the chemistry of your brain and then uh, you don't need physical spaces. So, so I get to ask questions that allowed from the from the from well, Sure, yeah. yeah. Class, the boss there. Well, so, you know, one of the, one of the reasons to go to, to go to church, right, to go to the museum um, is to, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we can see online, right, or we can see on our iPad or we can, we can download and take some kind of a virtual walking tour. Um, we can even take virtual walking tours of museums. I, I guess what, a question I would have for you is, do you feel that the, the, the museum's role, is the museum's role to present or is the museum's role to engage? And are those things possible to do in that kind of mediated way? Or, you know, how do you feel about doing it in that kind of a mediated way against those kind of two missions? Well, very quickly, you kind of like get to the what, you know, and look, what, what's the what here? Okay, these are these artists that are making what? Mm -hmm. Useless objects? Um, more or less, um, that there's a lot of capital that has accumulated in the private sector and a lot of people want to buy objects because they have a lot of money and they've, they've done everything else that they can do. I mean, they've done their houses and their vacations and their kids and their education and their family and everything else and they, they start buying art. I mean, that's kind of like what it is. And what it does, it fills, it fills up walls. Look around this. I mean, look at this guy. Look at whoever built this library. I mean, talk about technology. I mean, that's, and it's just, it's being enhanced in a kind of like a different way. So a whole cadre, a whole army of light manufacturers have come up. And they're, you know, I used to think 30 years ago that, uh, you know, graduate school, MFA programs, you know, producing more artists. Where? Why? You know, there are only 40 that make a living at it. Well, that's no longer true. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot more than 40. <laughs> I mean, and... They are highly trained and they're highly skilled. They're often kind of like skilled in technology. And their basic thing is to manipulate perception and experience in a certain way. And it doesn't even- I love that. It doesn't even matter what. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. It kind of like, so I'm trying, what am I, I'm sitting around here kind of like thinking, okay, you know, I'm sort of stuck with this because it's, you know, I'm at the end of my career and I kind of like did museum. So what am I going to do? I'm not going to come and work for you guys. I'm going to go and work for the Chinese government because they've got this huge population mass that's moving from the countryside to the urban setting and they have to build parks and performing art centers and shopping malls and entertainment complexes and art museums too because they're Chinese and they're 5,000 years of culture and they got to do that. But when you think about this light manufacturing and kind of like going back to your question, so what are what are museums for? To basically to showcase the material goods of all these light manufacturers? I mean, I'm sure there are some light manufacturers in the audience here. But um, that's what artists do. They make these things that are kind of like esoteric objects that somehow stimulate desire. Like, I want to own one. I want to own a Jeff Koons balloon dog puppy dog that's 15 feet high. It is so perfect. 
that he stopped production like 10 times in, in the 15 years until he got it to be absolutely impeccable. And we're going to build museums to do that. Yeah. You know? And we're going to build houses. You know, to, and the bigger, sometimes, it's not, the, almost the, it's not the bigger the better, but you have to have capacity. Because if you have capacity, then it's not an issue. If you don't have capacity, it becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you don't have a space that's big enough to show Jeff Koons or Richard Serra or stuff like that, then you can't do it. But if you do have a big space, there's no reason that you can't make small rooms and kind of like create an intimate experience, which is the range of this kind of like these material goods. So what is it? And then how does it, it doesn't, at the end of the day, I mean, you think about look where technology is. Remember, like, so 20 years ago, they just invented telephones? You know, um, I mean, portable phones. The first one was a shoebox, I remember, in the early 1990s. It weighed about 20 pounds. You had to carry it around in the in a taxi cab with you and dial up on it. I mean, what's going to be in 30 years? I don't, I mean, that's where you guys are kind of like, I mean, I don't even, I have no idea what, what's going on here. I mean, I, I think I'm de dealing with the remnant of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a different age, you know, where it was important, and it still is, for cities to build these kind of like temples of, uh, of uh, that communicate, you know, like the Disney Concert Hall, you know, or uh, stuff like that. Well, I know that it used to be that you went to Disney to see the film in real life, to see the characters running around, to see the real version of the virtual thing. And I also know it used to be you went to a museum to see the painting in real life that you'd seen in the book. But it seems like both of you guys are now messing with people to the point where you're not providing the physical experience of that thing they saw in a book or the, the, in media, but you're doing something else. Here, here's, a, here's an interesting issue, the issue of authenticity. I mean, authenticity is the kind of thing that motivates museums. I mean, do you have a piece of the true cross? You know, do you have, do you have the actual drawing by Leonardo? I mean, I'm sure this is a rare books library. There are probably some extraordinary volumes in this, in this thing. And the reason that it exists is that for somebody who wants to see the actual original and have this kind of like religious experience. They can come here and do it. You can probably see it. I mean, I just saw in the New York Times today, the Reichs Museum, for example, you probably saw that story, decided to put all of their imagery in high definition online free. Because their logic was is that if people were going to knock it off, why do a, a crappy uh, you know, technology thing. Just make it all free. So they have like you know a million objects. They're going to make every single object free in high definition for any purpose. You can decorate your cars, your house. You can make reproductions on a on an extraordinary scale. So and this is now. So where does this? What does that say about museums? What does that say about the manufacturers? And what does it say about the separate? Is there a separation? Maybe there's no separation. And maybe the only difference is that these, the artists still have this kind of like artist. You know, it's, it's an it's a identity. It's a one person. And so, you know, you, Jeff Koons is a Jeff Koons. I mean, you know what that is. Yeah, but I'll be able to download that Jeff Koons pretty soon and print it out, of, you know, not at home because it's too big, but I'll be able to get, you know, I'll be able to download a copy of that and print that out. And, you know, well, but then, then what does that, that do that, to authenticity? But, oh, well, I think it's an interesting question that, about that's, the authenticity. That's a question of content versus maybe public relations. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, it's like, it's like music or it's like Oprah Winfrey. I mean, it's how you manage a career. I mean, you don't think that kind of like artists have these kind of like oh, agents and advisors and, and recommenders and everything else that kind of like manage careers? I mean, manage and manipulate the markets? You know, manage and manipulate supply and demand? I mean, it all sort of exists out there. It's not kind of like as simple as it was 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 well, it's definitely changing, right? And I think that there's a, you know, and, and I, I, I don't pretend to understand the art world and the market that kind of it, it exists around it, but that idea of, you know, this is the one that the artist I like touched well, and made with that's his a, or her Yeah, hands, that's a point. Right? It's a piece of the true cross. Yeah, and, the, you know, how, how important is, you know, how important is that when... You know, the object itself can, can can be downloaded, can be 3D printed, can you know, I can I can I can have a version if it's if it's if it's the if it's the fetish that I kind of am interested in as opposed to the the hand of the artist in it. 
what does that mean? You know, I'll tell you one thing that we're that that I'm interested in is, you know, because we make these movies and we make these TV shows and we make these experiences that are somewhat authored and like like a piece of art where an author toils away, gets it perfect, even if they have to pause, you know, and take some 15 years. They they, they or the author or creator toils away, gets it perfect, and then presents it. Here's my film. Here's my TV show. Here is my piece of art or whatever, and then it's the static thing that people come and have this relationship with it over time that that, that changes. Um, and but it, but the relation the, the relationship is static, but the object, the relationship isn't static, but the object is. Um, and one of the things that we're starting to experiment with is well, what if these stories that we're telling weren't as static, right? What if the authenticity of the experience came from the unique moment of interaction that I'm having right now? In other words, this particular story will never happen again because this is the one we're having right now. This conversation won't happen again because this is the one we're having right now. If we can take that art and make it a little bit more ephemeral, if we can make it more emergent, um, you know, and, and again, our lens is through this entertainment lens of storytelling and experience, you know, does that, does that open up whole new opportunities um, to create authentic experiences? And they're, they're uniquely authentic because they're you know, they're, they're ephemeral, like, like a lot of art is. Performance art, especially. Oh. I'm talking about art like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so how, how does urbanization and globalization and travel and all that stuff play into this? I mean, does it affect what you do? Do you see it changing? How many Disney parks can you do? Yeah. How many museums do we need? You can do more Disney parks than you can do Guggenheim museums, I can tell you that. But I don't know, I'll bet they're pretty, but they're, no, they're I'll bet they track each other pretty well. They're, no, not, not, I, I meant Guggenheim <laughs> museums, I mean, I think that, because there's, I mean, that's a, sort of, that's an inside joke, I won't go into that one. But I think that, you know, there is something very, you go back to this reverential thing, I mean, we still exist in, in you know, for all the advances technologically that exist in society, we're still at a point of, you know, if you look at the, even look at the politics and the religious beliefs of this country, for example, that they're still, you know, by and large, these are still sort of conservative societies in certain ways. And they, it's partly because people have, I would think, think I'm just, who knows what I'm talking about now, but they have a limited capacity to absorb complexity and they want to believe in certain things. You know, and one of the things that museums do is that it kind of like, it, 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 there's an intuitive editing process. Is that you, know, you just figure, okay, if it's in a museum, well, it's a work of art. Good, yeah. Yeah, it must be good, yeah. I mean, somebody, somebody has standards, yeah. I mean, you know what it is. And then, you know, it's like our universities and our education systems, and so these standards get developed. And, you know, there's something that people want to see. They want to be able to suspend a certain level of contemplative reality. And while I want to push the museums, or I have this tendency to push museums a little bit more, not because I want to sort of tear down the thing or I've got a better program, but it's like you want to, you want to sustain a habit. You know, and you play the press. As I, you, you read out this number. I did 292 exhibitions. But you know, what are the two that people remember? Armani and the motorcycles. Wow. You know, because, um, because somehow they were portrayed in the press as kind of like these strategic moves to enhance audience. I mean, neither one of them did that, but from a public relations standpoint, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the Guggenheim brand, because we then started doing, you know, we did China, we did Aztecs, we did Mexico, we just did it impeccably. We did it really, really well, over the top good. And what you could say is that culture could be this, culture could be this, culture could be this, culture could be this. So I used to see myself as kind of like, you know, art for the masses. I mean, I was a socialist. I mean, I could work with the, uh, you know, I could, I could work with the communists. I could, <laughs> could work with the Russians and with the Chinese. Because we saw that, you know, there, there was a certain thing about kind of like making this stuff, you know, abundant and available without sacrificing the standard. That was the whole point. I mean, when we did motorcycles, whew. And we could, you couldn't have done Picasso any better. I mean, it was really, really well done. And it goes into, it starts to go into this entertainment side. Because what is this? Leisure time activity. I mean, look at how you organize your lives. I mean, how much is sleeping, how much is eating, how much is doing whatever you need to kind of like take care of your physical body and then your, you know, future preparation, family and all of this stuff. And then 
you have a certain amount of time for sports, you have a certain amount of time for entertainment, and we, we look at this, I mean, I'm sure you guys have calculated what the average percentile of a, of a person's time is that they can spend on the education side of it. And I think of it that way, and I figure, okay, you know, you know a regular museum goer, oh, you know, somewhere between two and six a year. You know, Visits? Yeah, not, not, not a fanatic, you know, but, a, but you know, an engaged, you know, mm -hmm. an engaged museum goer. Uh, is something like that, and you know, and you, you can basically slice it in terms of, uh, you know, pretty much in terms of age and audience and uh, economic uh, education. Educa educate. We, we have, yeah, we have profiles of who our visitors are because you want to enhance the number of visitors that you can get. It only makes sense, and if you can use architecture to do that, that's just it's, it's even better because it's a spectacular experience. I mean, I've been to Bilbao, what, you know, close to 150 times, maybe 200 times. I mean, I, it's, a, it's a visceral experience, and that was the whole point, visceral. You go in, and you don't have a choice. You just get seduced by it, because it's, it's seductive. I'll, I'll tell you that's, a, that's frank. Mm -hmm. a story about our urbanization, I think, how it changes things. And, and so I was having a conversation with, with somebody yesterday who is, I won't, I won't use their name, but somebody who's uh, a very sophisticated, senior level, hip um, executive in China today. Um, and he's probably 40. And he grew up in a village of 100 people uh, in the you know, interior of China, it did not have electricity. And actually the village was um, so small and, and poor that they didn't even have candles. Um, they, they had oil lamps, but they didn't even afford candles. And he saw his first car when he was seven. And it scared him so much he ran off the road and hit, hit in the bushes. And today, he lives in Shanghai, one of the most teeming metropolises you know, imaginable, living with the, you know, the highest technology. And just think about the, the level of change that this person has seen in his life uh, in China. Um, you know, everything is just compressed, you know, is compressed there. The, 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 the growth is, is, you know, immensely accelerating. It's, the, it's, like, the, it's like the closest to space travel I, I think I'll probably come, um, just kind of watching this happen. Um, but the, the uh, one thing that I see as a result of this is, you know, the nature of community there is, is really shifting or has shifted, you know, and it, this is this happened. This happened everywhere. It certainly happened here as well, where you know this nature of community starts off being geographic. You know, this is the this is the, the farm farm I was raised on, or this is the village I live in, you know, and then industrial revolution and um, and politics and economics drive us towards you know cities, and all of a sudden you know our, our communities are not defined by geography, but they're defined by commerce or industry or economics, and now we're moving into you know a place where our um, our communities are defined by culture or affinity. And I see that happening now uh, even more in China, where that wasn't even possible before, where communities are forming up around culture, they're forming around affinity, and they're, they're, they're chosen uh, communities. And those communities uh, now have an opportunity to come together to create you know, experiences and shared experiences in ways that weren't ever possible to do before. And I think that is a direct result of you know, economics, urbanization, yeah. the, the changing migration of people, and, and that, you know, and, 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 and I think a real interesting question is where, where does that go next, right? Yeah. What does the shifting nature of community become uh, when everything is just, when technology is seamless, instantaneous? You know, I think about, you know, so we're playing around with these Google Glass, uh, you know, glasses, which are, you know, they're kind of cumbersome, they're kind of clunky, um, you know, but, they're also kind of the harbingers of this idea of wearable computing, you know, where you have this always on connection, right? I mean, I guess I kind of have an always on connection too. My you know, Bluetooth watch and, you know, starting to, some, probably a lot of people have like little fitness devices, you know, the wearable, you know, that idea of wearable computing is, you know, is at the very early stages of it. Um, but when you have an always on connection, all the information is always there one step ahead of, you know, of, of, when, of when your system anticipates you're gonna want it you're, you're, you're always broadcasting, you're always receiving. That seamless uh, um, combination of existence and information and technology and you know, uh, infinite memory is gonna really kind of change the way we experience everything. And I think it's gonna fundamentally change the way we experience how we define communities. 
So we, we need to open it up to questions in a minute, but I want to ask one last one, which is how important is being a little bit off to both of you? I mean, Tom, you, I don't think you've ever done any Renzo Piano Museums. But that's a, he's a blue chip architect that I, does service. I, 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 I tried, but he wasn't buying. Okay. That's what it is. All right. So you're just not a, you can't afford blue chip architects? No, I could afford them. I mean, it wasn't about the money. I mean, I don't know what it was. I tried to get one of the piano ones. We tried to get him for, for Abu Dhabi on some projects, but, you know, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't buying. I don't know. I mean, because when you started working with Zaha and Frank and all kinds of people, well, I mean, what, was, what do you see in terms of creative vision? And what, what, how do you value that in architecture? I don't know. It was just kind of like intuitive. I mean, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't systematic. It was, you know, I started doing this in the late 1980s and the early 1990s. And, you know, Frank had had some sort of cool show that Martin Friedman did at the Whitney or something yeah, like that. Sure. And, you know, so I had him come to Mass MoCA. And, uh, you know, it, I mean, it was a project that, that ultimately was realized, but we couldn't. In, not, not on the architectural plan that we had sort of, but then it kind of like, it's set, centered in your mind. I mean, Arata Isazaki was important, kind of like early on. Zaha was important, right? Jean Nouvelle was important. Rem Coolhouse, I mean, we had, uh, the, the yeah, two Vegas. projects that we built in Las Vegas, to me were kind of like completely, you know, one of the most succinct and kind of like defined experiences, you know, from concept to ribbon cutting was nine months. Yep. For oh. two museums, one was 65,000 square feet and one was uh, 10,000 square feet. And, and to my mind, almost, almost impeccable, but in that sort of cerebral way, which was kind of like completely different from the, the kind of um, sort of emotional and sort of in, in, intuitive things that we do with Frank and some stuff like that. But it was just purely accidental. I mean, it wasn't a plan. I mean, I didn't set out to become... No, but he must have like given Ram the space to be Ram. I mean, that's what well, he was talking about yeah, doing. Part of, this is, yeah, part of this is being able to, at least it was in the early days, you know, being able to push back and have the respect of the architects. I mean, I used to... I mean, Frank is here, so I can kind of like tell stories about Frank. Um, but, you know, I, I, when I use this thing about Colombo, he, he struck me as kind of like, you know, I've, I once said in an interview, Frank had the biggest ego of any architect I ever met because he was so confident of his abilities that if I gave him a lot of crap on something, he told me he had to redesign it, he would do it willingly because he thought that he could do it better the second time. He was so confident about that. Whereas there were certain architects that I won't name that I inherited more or less. And this is not, this is not Frank uh, Lloyd Wright, uh, you know, who you wanted to change a, a doorknob. I mean, it was kind of like a federal case. Yeah, you couldn't do this. The but the thing about, the thing about it is you, you could do this over and over and over and over with Frank. It was almost endless. Like, he really enjoyed this process. Not everybody enjoyed that process. And to me, that was a huge learning, um, a learning experience. I mean, for what? But it was kind of, you could play and you could push. And once you start kind of like you, you push and push and push, I think that architects need, I mean, I guess if there's a lesson here, what architects need a client, you know, and maybe an intermediary between the client and the money, because, you know, the guys who were paying for the, the private development are kind of like going to maybe, unless they're Disney maybe, but they're going to be concerned about they don't want to spend that much over the top on some of the things. Mm -hmm. So we operated in this middle ground where we could actually, you know, on the one hand, you know, act as bad boys and inspire the architects to do something way beyond just to get it on the table, mm -hmm. and then kind of like come over the come after that and sort of, uh, and it too to a certain extent it worked. I mean. That's why, you know, Abu Dhabi is, Abu Dhabi was the apotheosis. You can't believe how big that project. Well, you were there. I mean, you know, you did one of the buildings, what I'm saying. Um, it was just, it was just something, you know, to go from, to find a client who's willing to spend $5 billion on 25 architects and you get to choose them. I thought that was cute. <laughs> <laughs> and Scott, where are you guys at with, uh, I mean, how important is the kind of Euro Disney days of having architects come in and give a vision to things? And how much do you do that inside? Not that you do that part, you do something else. But. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I don't know that I know how to answer that question. But, but you know, when you talk about bringing in, you know, that, those, you know, that was definitely, and this, that was before my time at the company, so I can't really speak knowledgeably about, you know, Michael Eisner's kind of, um, vision for, for, you know, 
patronage for you know of these of these. But it's a different vision now. It's a totally different vision, isn't it? Well, you know, Michael had his vision for you know. I mean, when you look at some of the work that was done, you know, are we really recognizing, you know, are we really recognizing a lot of benefit from having those you know those unique you know egos and architects that did some of that work. Um, are we really recognizing the vision from it? The people who are experiencing it, do they recognize that? Do they, do they care, frankly? And I'm, I'm not sure that the answer is yes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, these are great spaces, many of them. But not 30 all of them. years from now, it might be. 30 years from now, they might be, right? And that might have been an absolutely fantastic call to basically say, this is art for art, you know, this is art. And we're going to, you know, the, we, we don't really care if we're, you know, we're going to support the art. We're not going to necessarily yeah. be efficient with function here. Um, and that might absolutely be the be the case. What I, what I would say now is the you know the the work of the architect to define and interpret and shape the experience of space is absolutely more important than ever for us for all the reasons we've been talking about. The the great experiences you can get you can download you know that are the great you know the world can be brought to you in an app. You know, your, your 4K TV at 60 frames a second is, you know, on, in your, your new X, you know, Xbox One is creating this amazing, amazing, beautiful imagery that's almost indistinguishable from reality, but it's not reality. And more than ever, that physical sense of space and coming together in places where communities form and share and there's an interchange, that is more important, I believe, more important than ever. The more, the more isolated our lives become, the more independent we, you know, the more we dive into these devices, the more some of us are driving, you know, are, are kind of longing for that um, crafted, um, authored, and, and considered experience of space, which I think, you know, clearly the, you know, clearly the architect brings. Um, our approach to that is probably more cinematic and narrative than it is pure, uh, you know, exploration of form. Yep. You know, it's probably more didactic in that in that way, I guess. But the uh, you know the, that intent is still there. Mm -hmm. But this was like, look at this room. This was high technology at the time. That's sort of like similar to this. Imagine carving that ceiling. You know, that probably was not like this is not the 16th century. This is probably what early 20th century, and they probably were using yeah. whatever sophisticated technology that existed at the time to kind of like to create a. <clears throat> You know, a three-dimensional effect, and that this was the state of the technology at the time, and the technology has moved. And what you're doing is, is is interesting for that reason: is that you have the resources to be able to mobilize this kind of image image technology, yeah, and and then you know find an architecture to kind of like to carry it, which is kind of extraordinary. But I mean, if you well, also build the monorail and the subway. And the well, yeah, yeah, of course, all. But I'm just, you know, it's it's the technology that's driving this to a certain extent. And it's funny because I think, you know, I look at this space and I and I think of the storytelling of this space, right? You yeah. know, and I'm and I'm I, I'm I'm like, I wonder, you know, the subject of that painting that's missing. What did they do to offend? You know, they're gone. They're just gone. They're wiped from the wall. Whatever they did. Uh, but this space kind of tells a story and allows us to, you yeah. know. But this this was high technology at the time. Yeah. This type of storytelling was was set. Okay. Well, so we've got fifteen minutes for questions from the room. Anybody have any questions? Enjoying the panel, Scott. What's Disney's long term plan with Epcot Center? Um. Well, I, I'm not here to talk about specific plans, but I, I can tell you that. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, when you think about Epcot and Walt's original vision for that experimental prototypical community of tomorrow or city of tomorrow, the, uh, you know, that, that is a still a promise that, that we think uh, is, un, is unmet. Um, and uh, we are looking at, you know, it's an, it's an interesting challenge. How do we bring in a, you know, in a commercial way, how do we bring a vision that was so audacious um, as, as Disney's original vision for what that wanted to be, how do we bring that to, you know, um, how do we bring that to life? What I said earlier about kind of like driving people from uh, kind of being spectators to participants to activists, um, I think that the original vision that was driving um, Epcot, that sense of, that sense of bold optimism is, is still alive inside the company and, and, Ep and Epcot is absolutely a place where we're kind of looking to refocus some of that and re-envision what it might want to be and what it might want to represent. For generations, it actually, you know, it, it, it actually 
we know this because we get these letters, there are people who were so inspired by what they saw there at the time that they, they became, you know, they became scientists, they became astronauts, they became, you know, um, teachers. Um, and I'm not sure that we're as successful at, at inspiring today as we as we once were. And and we are we're looking at how we bring that back reinvigorate that sense of inspiration, that sense of bold optimism, that celebration of human achievement, without being specific about what the plans are. <laughs> Where do we put Las Vegas in this, uh, yeah. in, in, this in this landscape? I mean, um, they must fit in some place. I mean, can you think about you know, what they're trying to do, these they create these sort of themed realities. Yeah, kind of like it's well, really? Do they? I uh, well, I, I, it, it's hard to argue it's not an authentic experience, but it's not necessarily an authentic experience. It, you know, it is clearly a designed experience. Yeah. And it's an authentic experience. I'm not sure it is. It's not a. Uh, it's a themed experience as well. Well, I always is. go out there for the technology because the Cirque du Soleil. They've got the biggest robots on Earth. Well, but I'm, in Vegas. yeah, it's all part. It's all part of it. I mean, it's you know, it's the hotels, the scale of it. Yeah. They, the, you know, they, 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 they recreate stuff like this out of yeah. a sense of nostalgia, you know. And but sometimes they can be futuristic. I'm just saying, how in the in the realm of hu human experience, what's the typical? You know, you, you asked the question about where's urbanization going. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you that about a month ago, China officially became an urban country as they crossed mm -hmm. over from. 49.999 to 50.111 percent of the population now living in an urban environment. So that China's an urban country. And look what's going on in the last 20 years. Imagine where that's going. And some of the, I mean, some of the stuff that they're doing there is, I mean, you could say, you could say it's I don't know, good or bad or whatever you want to do. I mean, where, does all, where do you draw the line around authenticity? Well, one of the things in Vegas, though, is because, and it, it might be interesting to think about it, because it's not China and it's not Abu Dhabi and it's not the Guggenheim, Something that got developed pretty early, which also had something to do with art and entertainment and the casinos, just got duplicated in different flavors over and over and over again without really having to change itself up. And I know, having watched both of your careers for some amount of time, you have to change things up because the next one's got to be different than the last one in some way. I think Vegas doesn't really have that problem. I mean, I think they, they target their demographics and they do a different flavor of the same thing right now. Really? So, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. But they but would be, I mean, this is all available to being, you know, to being appropriated. I mean, the technology is available to being appropriated. I mean, that's what Steve Wynn tried to do with art. It's what they do to a certain extent with their kind of like, you know, Cirque du Soleil and their yep. virtual reality types of things. I mean, Las Vegas is not a single thing. Sure. But the point is, is that 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 kind of entertainment experience know, yeah, with, with, with gambling and food thrown in. Yeah. You, I, know. you know, I was I happened to be there this past weekend in Vegas, because actually Cirque is opening a new show in a few weeks, and I was there for you know a preview of it and um, helping out on a couple things, and I was struck by the by from my perspective how how um, how non unique most of those most of those hotels, the, the, the yeah. main hotels, right? I mean, there's a, there's a great deal. I think you're right. They, there's, a, there's a form that has been kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of same meat, you know, same there's meat. Like kind of thing. There's like still, a package. There's like a package. But it's evolving. It's evolving because of technology. This is not like in Frank, Frank Sinatra's era. I mean, yeah, this yeah. isn't, you know, it's not like the 1960s, you know. But what, I mean, I would, what I would argue is that it is a, you know, those, those, those hotels, and there's some wonderful stuff in there, and there's, you know, there's actually some really, really interesting stuff that happens in that town. I don't, I don't, I, but the experience is, you know, you're not having an authentic Parisian experience. You're not having an authentic Venetian experience. You're not having an authentic, uh, um, you know, I, I don't know, uh, uh, Philippine Islands experience. You're having an authentic Las Vegas experience, right? That's what's authentic about it, is the Las Vegas experience. It is, it, it is it, that you know that is where that authenticity comes in, and I'm not quite sure that the differentiation between well, a lot of those hotels really well, plays out. I mean, I, I just, it just popped up, but I just happened to be I was in Las Vegas in, in February, and I was talking with with uh, Rob Goldstein, who runs gambling operations for the Venetia for the Venetian, 
he was basically saying, look at all of this. I mean, 9,000 hotel rooms and kind of like football fields of gambling and all of that stuff. He said, it's insignificant. He said, it means nothing to our bottom line. It only throws off 495 million a year. He said, but we get 3 billion a year in China. 3 billion a year in China. All of their focus is kind of like, you know, the, the Las Vegas could disappear. So I mean, we're talking about China, we're talking about scale, we're talking about almost no rules, you know, and what, what happens? You can try to imagine the future? I mean, Jesus. You know, I, I, could, I, wouldn't begin to, I wouldn't know where to start, you know, what, what it's going to be. It just when you think of the kind of like the, you know, the multiples of the logarithmic progression that of, of the last 20 years, I mean, how can you imagine what all this stuff is going to be like in 20 years? I think all you have to do is look at Macau and see, yeah. you know, over the past 15 years. Exactly right, that's what I'm saying. Can Disney do stuff in China they can't do here? No. Okay. All right, other questions? You know, we've been talking so far as if there's a universal culture, and um, the reason why both of you were invited to the certain countries you were was because of an American brand. So my question to you is, for example, um, Scott, in China, are you creating programming that is actually uh, sort of culturally specific to China, or is it just, you know, pretty much, you know, you talk about the Las Vegas experience, you're yeah. bringing the Disney experience, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll And then for, for uh, Tom also, you know, Abu Dhabi, I mean, you're not involved in, I don't know if you're involved in the curatorial part or not, but is there a programming aspect that's gonna be more kind of region specific? So I think, you know, it, it, we're absolutely bringing in all, you know, our kind of mantra for China is authentically Disney, distinctly Chinese. And that is you know, bring the kind of the core DNA of what is liked and loved and desired about the Disney experience and Disney stories and characters and kind of the, the kind of the ethos, but tell it through a Chinese lens. Um, so it resonates with that audience. And this is true for anywhere we go in the world. And, you know, that we have to kind of, we have to understand the audience. And it comes down to such um, uh, uh, subtle things as, you know, subtleties of color palette that make a huge difference. And by the way, these are all lessons hard learned, right? We didn't go, you know, I think we kind of went in saying, well, we'll build what we built before, and it'll, you know, and people seem to like it. And, you know, it's like, well, why isn't this working here? It's, you know, and, and trying to understand you know, the, the, uh, the reasons why those subtle differences happen, and it's everything from color palette and, you know, we have the unique advantage of, or, I don't know, obligation to design 360 degrees, five, all five senses, so like I say 365 design, you know, because we design how things smell, taste, touch, everything. And when you start, look, when you start dealing with um, all of those culturally specific palettes and impressions, it gets very, very, uh, important to understand what works and what doesn't work in that culture, and, and, and we have to do that. We have to do that globally. And it's everything from stories. You know, in, in, in Western stories, we have this kind of idea of a hero who rises up, and you know, uh, you know, classic Western literature: the hero rises up and wins the day, and you know, gets the girl and rides off into the sunset, and all that. And that's not necessarily true in all, all cultures. You know, great traditional Chinese stories are. You know, there's a, there's a great tradition about self-sacrifice, and the true hero is the one who kills themselves to save the village and doesn't get the girl but dies honorably. And it's kind of like, well, that's not a great story. <laughs> we don't know how to tell that story, but um, we have to understand what's important about that story and then kind of reflect that through the characters and worlds we build uh, for those audiences. I, I don't want to pretend like we know how to do it well, right? I think we're learning how to, we're, lear we're trying to learn how to do it well, globally. I could make two points on that, to follow up that, that question. I think one is that, you know, 15 years ago, there were no Chinese artists that you recognized that participated in markets at the same way that Western art, artists do, and that's no longer the case. Um, and, you know, we had something to do with that. Because they all had shows at the Guggenheim. What? Yeah, they all had shows at the Guggenheim. Yeah, well, I'm like, like, whoa, no, because yeah. the question's not fair, because you what? launched a whole contemporary yeah. well, Chinese but, no, but, culture. No, 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 but, but, no, no, I didn't, I, no, not it at all. It's something no, to no, do no, with no, 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 bringing no, it west. This, this look at this is every, everybody's wired, you know, by the Internet these days. I mean, where they live, whether they live in Beijing or Shanghai or... 
Paris or New York. And there was a moment in the 80s and 90s where Chinese artists were kind of like migrating to Paris and New York. I mean, Ai Weiwei spent eight years in New York yeah, and stuff like that. So all of these guys basically share a common language. And so therefore, it's just simply, it's like the Olympics. In other words, if you have a pool of a billion people to choose from, you're going to get a couple of fast runners, you know, if you have a good training program. And it's going to happen, it's going to happen in China. I mean, you, you can reduce these things to numbers. Having said that, the opposite story maybe is, a, is a, my second comment is the one on Bilbao, or sorry, Abu Dhabi, is that when I called the museum the apotheosis, it was the content apotheosis. It wasn't the architecture. The architecture wrapped around, we spent most of the time on the concept and we tried to rationalize for, a, you know, for its location and for a modern and a contemporary museum, let's say, that dealt with from the 1960s onward. So we spent a lot of time, and I hired six curators from their various who I thought were the best in the world, all from the Middle East, to be advisors on how we could build a collective. We had a big amount of money. They were going to make $600 million available for acquisitions, and that was a good place to start because you, you could, you, we were going to build a, a collection of Middle Eastern artists. And the thing about the thing about art making is art making is biological. You know, the art market is a little bit different. It's kind of like something else. You have to have real, you have to be developed countries. I mean, the art market developed in Europe and then in the United States, but there's not a big art market. Uh, well, there might be for antiquities to a certain extent, but that takes place in London and New York largely. But the, the point is, is that you know, an artist in and, and, and opportunity, market makes opportunity. You know, Jeff Koons can sell paintings for $3 million because he can afford to make paintings that sell for $3 million <laughs> because he can sell them. And somebody else who works in a studio has to work on a, on, a, on, a, on a very different scale. And genius is not always some sort of intuitive thing. It's largely a function of, this, of, 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 of having the circumstances that foster this kind of creativity. But what we did in Abu Dhabi, which is a point that I'm getting to, we had five floors. And we tried to kind of like do almost like a theme park when I think about it now. We tried to divide up the museum into these territories, which were highly arbitrary, but somewhat balanced. And the arbitrary was in, in these three territories were Europe and the Americas, which means North and South America and all of Europe, um, Asia, South Asia, and eastward, but mainly China and eastward, and then Africa and um, uh, the Middle East as the, as the third territory. And we we went from commissions to collection building and trying to balance this thing as a universal museum that placed the achievement of, this is a spectacular achievement of, of Islamic culture, you know, into a, a certain context. I mean, I got, I mean, the, the circumstance that I got involved in all of this stuff was I took a motorcycle ride through Turkey in the early 1970s and I went to a mosque by Sinan. Uh, in Adirne, which happened to be the apotheosis, the best building ever designed anywhere by any architect, including the architects in the room. I mean, you know, his, uh, his uh, Salimia in Adirne is just an exquisite thing. And this achievement is not balanced. You know, you, it, so what we tried to do in Abu Dhabi was not translate an American culture. And you know that when we had you guys come and do these pavilions and stuff like that, we had, we had architects from all over the world. Yeah, sure. You know, including uh, um, architects from the Middle East who were kind of like, you know, all doing these kind of like pavilions. I mean, it was a grand vision. I mean, I, I don't know, Frank could probably tell you more about whether the vision's being realized or not because I've not been involved in the project since I kind of like officially left it. Um, but, you know, it had this kind of, it was meant to be the ultimate statement about what a museum could be in a kind of like a balanced world, you know, that tried to sort of see Western achievement is one third of what was going on. Mm -hmm. But anyway, sorry, I got off on that. No, no, that's just great. All right, well, so we got to wrap up. Yeah, you can ask the last question. <laughs> we may not be able to answer it. I read an uh, article about architecture from a uh, person in UIC. He defined there are two kinds of architecture. One is about one is totally about uh, metaphor and uh, symbolic uh, symbolism, which he used examples from uh, uh, like architects like Robert Venturi. I think also what's about saying a lot about Disneyland. I think that can also belong to that kind of architecture about 
many, many and cultural expression. And there's, uh, uh, he finds there is another kind of architecture, which is totally about uh, rigorous, rigorous and uh, rationality. And he used examples as uh, uh, architects like, like, like those blobby architects, which defined by Professor Lin. I think you have defined. Yeah. Uh, Intellectual uh, blobbing. <laughs> I think what's really interesting to me is that, is that uh, uh, before I read his article and also before I read about your article uh, about the architecture for the curve narrative, I thought what, uh, what, what impressed me most about those kind of bloody architecture is about, it, is, it, is about its form, it's about its statics. But after reading about those articles, I think it's really about you control the pra uh, parameters and you don't even think about what comes out eventually. You just, you just really care about the like cultural and or maybe about uh, context, uh, the, con the context factors. Um, I think this, I, I really want to listen about what your comment on um, my thoughts. Like, uh, is your architecture more about you're not supposed to ask me questions. You're supposed yeah. to ask them questions. <laughs> I'm, I'm following. <laughs> You're following. Yeah. Go ahead. No, that, that guy Bob Sommel is a troublemaker who wrote that article. Um, but no, I have always been interested in entertainment, art, always through technology. I think, uh, I don't know how an architect can't be interested in culture. But I, I really think culture is moving more and more towards a lot of questions about how we entertain ourselves, how we spend our leisure time, how we educate ourselves. I don't think it's about contemplating forms. I mean, that's for sure. And one of the things that I think both Tom and Scott understand is that architecture is not about making beautiful forms. Architecture is about making amazing experiences and engaging in places and with content in a way that's not just about perfect form. And, and that's the one thing that I really lament about museum design currently is there are a lot of museums that are trying to make perfect, beautiful forms. And, and I don't really think that's what a museum's about. I don't think it's what a theme park or an entertainment space is about, is that kind of beauty or that kind of contemplation. I mean, it's not a religious yeah. thing. I mean, you want to have a new experience. You don't want to have a, you know, ephemeral like out of body experience. Anyway, with this technology, because you get too much of it from your cell phone and everything else, it's out of body. But anyway, we, I'm under strict instructions. <laughs> We're four minutes late. And so thank you very much. This is a really interesting. <laughs>